Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online internet around the world church service. And I'm so glad that you are here today. Praise God. Let's take our Bibles and go to Leviticus chapter 27. We're going to receive the tithes and the offerings. We're going to bring them into the storehouse of the Lord, and you are going to be greatly blessed. Amen. Verse 30 says, and all the tithe of the land, and let's remember that the tithe is 10%. So 10% of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Verse 32, and concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. My friends, tithing is a commandment that we see in scripture, and it is an act of worship that we do with a loving heart. It is an act of celebrating the goodness and the faithfulness of God. But my friends, tithing also is a holy action that we do. Some Christians, they take the holy tithe, which is 10% perhaps of their income or whatever it might be. They take the tithe, which belongs to the Lord, and they go out and they buy a new television with it, or they do something else with it besides what God has intended it to be used for. And then they sit back perplexed and wonder why the devil has gotten access into their lives. That's because the tithe is holy. It says in verse 32, the tenth, the tithe shall be holy to the Lord. So it belongs to God. Now in Exodus chapter 13, and in the same verse, which would be verse 13, we read, but every firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among you, sons, you shall redeem. Anything that comes out of the womb or anything that we would say comes out of the matrix for the first time belongs to the Lord, including what? including the tithe, praise God. Now, Romans 11, verse 16, we see the principle continue. Let me uh, jump over there. Verse 16 says, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. The first is always the Lord's uh, portion. When the tithe, which is 10%, is brought to the Lord, then everything else is covered and blessed by God. Woo! Praise God. And then we see in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, these two very powerful verses, verse 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. My friends, we should not only tithe but as monies come into us, the tithe should be pulled out first. We shouldn't pay the light bill first and then the electric bill. And then maybe if there's something left over, we'll give God a little smidget. But no, we should honor the Lord by making sure that he gets the tithe first. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. We notice here that abundance, that plenty and overflow follows those whom honor God with the first fruit by getting the tithe into the Lord Jesus. Praise God. What you do with the first determines if God blesses the rest. When the first fruit is given in faith and with a heart of love, God does something amazing. He rebukes the devourer. Malachi chapter 3, we see God on the scene acting on behalf of the tither. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Now God said that. He said, I will do it. And there could be some areas where you're still growing and developing in your authority in Jesus. 
And there could be some areas where maybe the devil would try to push you around. But as a tither, God says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And when God rebukes the devourer, he has to back off regardless of what form of devouring that would be. Because there are some things that medical science can't, they cannot keep from coming through. There are some things that maybe security guards could not keep from coming through, but God can. And he does it for who? He does it for the tither so that he, the devourer will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field says the Lord of hosts. So this, this is something that God does. And when you tithe, you also connect with your spiritual father, Abraham, because Abraham was a man that trusted God and understood that the way that we please Jehovah God is by taking his word in faith and obeying him. We know him as the father of faith, but my friends, we see also that Abraham was a tither. So when you also tithe like your forefather Abraham did, because in Christ you are now tied into the Abrahamic blessing. When you now tithe, you are connecting with that same legacy of faith and it takes faith to please God. Now, somebody might say, well, pastor Stephen, that was in the old Testament. That was under the law. No, my friends, it was not. And many of you know that, that when Abraham was tithing, there was no law yet that said, you must do this. Now, later God instituted the law through his servant Moses, but Abraham was tithing when there was no law. He was doing it out of love and out of faith and out of honor to the Lord. And we see that also Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, we see also that he, my friends, was a tither as well. So tithing establishes the open heavens over your life. And with the open heavens of protection and blessing and the spiritual reign of kingdom ideas, touching your mind, touching your understanding, you will not be in a dry or barren place. Praise God. You know, I have been to the hottest place on the face of the earth. That's death Valley there in the uh, Mojave desert. And it's a 20 million acre national park. And it actually reaches in, it's primarily in Southern California, but it's actually in four states. And as hot as it is, the reason why it's so destitute of moisture is because there's not an open heaven. It doesn't rain there and it gets so blistering hot. It can get to 130 degrees. Matter of fact, when I was much younger, I almost lost my life there and I would have been a contributor to the name death Valley. They would have thought, well, we've had another one added to the list, but God spared my life and had mercy on me. I got, um, I got off the trail and I shouldn't, I shouldn't have been hiking solo, but I got off the trail back in those days. There were no cell phones. There was no GPS, no emergency beacons. And I got, um, I got off the trail and got into an area that was very difficult to get out of. And that, that sun, I tell you it, I think that day it got to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. And I thought I was just about a goner. I actually dropped down into a cleft of a rock that had just a little bit of an overhang that, um, that had a little bit of shade. And that gave me about a 20 minute reprieve. But even in the shade, it was still over a hundred degrees. And my body was already in critical condition. I'd completely stopped sweating. I couldn't even sweat anymore. By the way, if that would have been the end of my earthly life, nobody ever would have found me because this like hidden little cave, this cleft in the rock was so secretive that there was actually there lay next to where I was the giant skeleton, particularly the massive horn structure and the, the, uh, the antlers of a huge mountain goat that had died there. And those type of animals, they want to die in a very secretive place where they're never seen or found. Well, <laughs> I know where they go <laughs> because I almost joined them. Praise God, but praise the Lord. My friends as a tither, you don't have to be out in these barren, 
hot wilderness type places you have the moisture you have the refreshing of the Holy Spirit kingdom ideas flowing you have protection even from maybe uh, unintentional crazy type scenarios that you could find yourself in yet God will deliver you and protect you and preserve you amen even if it takes miracles for him to do it there are so many blessings I want to encourage you to step into obedience because we know from the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 that the Lord himself said, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Part of our obedience is tithing. So let's rise today and honor the Lord with our tithes. And of course, we can also give an offering on top of that as the Holy Spirit leads you. Okay. For those of you that are mailing in your tithes and offerings, you can send them to Stephen Brooks International P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina. The zip code is 28654. Now, if you want to bring your tithe or your special offering in online, you can do so from anywhere in the world by going online and go to the website stephenbrooks.org, and you'll see the link on the homepage that says Give, and it has a red heart, and you can click that. And from anywhere in the world, you can bring your tithe in, and it comes right into the storehouse of the Lord, and it enables us to continue to preach the gospel around the world unabated, and we thank God for your giving. Now, please lift your hands. Father, I pray for your precious people that are watching today. I thank you, Father God, that we have protection in you. I thank you, Father, that even right now, your angels are rebuking what would have been potential uh, forms of devourment, but it's never going to happen because your people are tithing. And we thank you, Father, where, whether it's a dangerous microbe or whether it's a financial microbe, it's not going to get through your shield of defense that is around the tither. So, Father, bless your people with great increase. And we honor you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Woo! Praise God. Now, let me announce also, my friends, that we do have our upcoming Israel tour. And I would really like for you to pray about going. The dates are May 7th through the 17th. I'm telling you, uh, some of you don't know how amazing this trip is. This thing is loaded. And it, uh, it is um, first class all the way. It's going to be absolutely beautiful. Did you know that in the scheduling of the hotels and so forth that we're going to be at, did you know that my wife worked with the tour company to schedule us that when we're at the Sea of Galilee, we're going to be staying at the Scots Hotel? Do you know, how, you know how many tour groups wish they could stay there? But we got it. Woo, we got it on the schedule, amen. And you can go with us and not only experience the beautiful Sea of Galilee, where so much of the Lord's ministry took place around, but you can stay in a beautiful hotel. You're going to think you went back to the uh, uh, Renaissance or something. This place is absolutely beautiful. Looks like a castle. And uh, we start our tour in Israel uh, in Netanya. Most High-ranking political officials, when they retire, where do they want to live? They want to live in uh, Netanya, and it is right on the Mediterranean coast. And so one of the best ways to knock off the jet lag is for us to meet in Tel Aviv. That's where you will arrive at, and just get some of that fresh ocean saltwater breeze from the Mediterranean, and you'll, you'll feel so good, praise God, and you're going to love it. The food's off the chart. And look, you got me for 11 days. Me and Pastor Kelly will be hanging out with you on the bus with you. We're going to laugh together, uh, pray together, and rejoice and see the best of Israel. Please pray about coming and get registered quick. We're only like three months out. This is really the best of Israel. I know for many, it's like the trip of a lifetime. I understand that, but I want you to come and join us. Okay, so call the 800 number and get registered. Husbands, bring your wife. Uh, wives, br bring your husband. If the spouse, for some reason, can't go, bring another friend, praise God, and come along. Bring somebody and jump on the trip with us. And even if you live in another country or, um, you know, we're, we're flying from wherever we're at, like for me, that would be Charlotte, okay? I'm going to fly out of Charlotte and 
picked, uh, I'll connect with the main flight in New York, and then over we go to Tel Aviv. So whether you're in Charlotte or whether you're in California or Texas or whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, the travel agency will work with you to get your main flight out of New York, okay, on the big plane. And then we all meet in Tel Aviv. It's all planned out with great detail, and it's going to be great. But even if you want to come, and maybe you're in Singapore or China or uh, the UK, or just call the travel agency, and they'll just work with you. You're already, many of you, you're, you're, you're closer than we are to Israel. Sometimes I'm a little envious, righteously envious of my friends in the UK. You're only four hours away from Israel. But um, just call the travel agency and get scheduled. They'll work with you, and uh, this trip is going to be amazing. Let me get you that phone number again. It's one 800 929 46 Eight four. Select option two. By the way, this is one of the greatest travel agencies in the world. When um, very well-known ministers want the very best tour, this is the company they call. And we've, of course, have worked with them before. And you're going to have a great time. Woo! So I'm looking forward to seeing you in the Holy Land. Praise God. Now, we're also, one more announcement. We're getting close to March. March 10th. 11th and 12, me and Pastor Kelly will be in Texas. I'm going to be preaching, ministering in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm telling you, it's going to be hot. It's going to be a hot, hot meeting. It's, I, I already have gotten it in my spirit. I know others are, it's, it's going to be a glory meeting. And so I would highly encourage you, any of my Texas friends, or if you're close by and want to drive over, or if you're far away and want to come, uh, get into that meeting because it's going to be, um, the Holy Spirit's going to be moving. Again, the dates are March 10th. Okay, that's Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, 10th, 11th, 12th. That information very soon will be on the website. If uh, In the interim, uh, until we get that popped up, if you want more info, just email us, contact at stephenbrooks.org, and we'll plug in all the details to you, okay? Love to see you down in Texas. Boy, San Antonio's got some phenomenal Restaurants, probably some of the best um, uh, Tex-Mex food in the world. Woo, praise God. We're going to have a great time. All right, let's jump into today's message. I want to talk about the tremendous miracle dynamics of fasting today, okay? And we're going to begin in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that this is our food. This is our food. We thank you that our human bodies... And uh, uh, they have to have physical food, but our spirit man will shrivel up and be uh, weak if we do not have good spiritual food. So, Father, today we ask your Holy Spirit would anoint the word, anoint the message, and that it feed us. And we thank you. This is our faith food in Jesus' name. And we say amen. Praise God. Matthew chapter 17 Let's begin this morning in verse 18. Let me get a drink of hot tea real quick. Praise the Lord. And we're starting in verse 18, and it says, Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. Not surprising, right? <laughs> and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, and he's not really trying to, um, you know, like really scold them or reprimand them. He's taking this moment to teach them so that they can have the results and the success that God wants them to experience. Praise God. For assuredly, I say to you, this is very important. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. So it only takes a little bit of this God kind of faith. You don't, you don't need like the whole tree, just a little bitty seed. A mustard seed is very, very tiny. So it only takes a, vault, a, a small amount of this really powerful faith to get the job done. If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, some Christians, they are doing a, uh, 
a good biblical principle, which is really throughout the word of God. They are speaking to the mountain and they are telling the mountain to move. But what is happening is that some are still not seeing the results they want. And the mountain is proving to be very, very stubborn. That could be, and it's not surprising that if it is, it could be very well that that particular mountain that you're commanding to leave could be held there in place by a demon that you're not able to physically see with your eyeballs. So we could say that there is an invisible resistor like we see in verse 18 and re- and Jesus rebuked the demon. So the mountain could be a mountain of sickness. Here we have a a young boy with epilepsy, but behind the epilepsy is the deeper problem, which is the core problem. There is a demon. And so there was a situation that the apostles ran up against that their normal mode of ministry was not producing. And that's why we need to talk about fasting, which is so important. And I, I know that many of you, you do pray and you love God. And you do have a good prayer life. And I know that many of you are very gracious, generous givers. And so you're doing very good in that area because we know that the Lord talked about the three primary disciplines of every believer, which are prayer, giving, and fasting. But we do have to be honest and get down a little bit into the nitty gritty because fasting still today is something in the American church that is not widely participated in. And we have, we have many ministers that have taught on it. I myself have a book called fasting and prayer. And this book, uh, the Lord has caused it to go around the world. And, uh, it, it has, uh, gotten out quite a bit here in America. And you have other ministers that have also written really good books on the subject of fasting. But when you look at the overall picture of how big uh, the church in America is, we still have to realize that fasting is absolutely something that's not widespread practiced in the American church. Praise God. Now, I have heard over the years, particularly probably over the last maybe eight to the 10 years, something that's, uh, that is kind of popular amongst uh, American believers, and that's what they would call going on a Daniel fast. The, uh, the only problem with that is that uh, what Daniel did was actually not a fast, and we have to talk about that in just a moment. So I have met personally some Christians who love God, and they are going through what they call a Daniel fast. I've actually met some that have gained weight on it and um, they're trying all these veggie recipes and they're trying all kinds of new spices because maybe they're not eating the meat or maybe they're not eating like really nice breads like Daniel pulled back from. So that leaves them with a plethora of all other kinds of foods. And it's almost like they're having cooking classes while technically they say they're fasting. And even, even sometimes on these so-called Daniel fast, they're actually gaining weight. And that, that right there should tell you, uh, something here is not lining up. Um, and so let's talk about that for a moment by turning over to the book of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, praise the Lord. And let's jump into verse two. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Okay, so that's 21 days. Therefore, we know sometimes people call it a 21-day Daniel fast. But yet, look at verse 3. I ate no pleasant food. So he didn't say he wasn't eating food. He just says, I ate no pleasant food, no meat. Okay, so no uh, kosher Hebrew national hot dogs, no filet mignon steaks, no uh, double cheeseburgers. He, he's pulling back from those types of things. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he's pulled back from the Krispy Kreme donuts. He uh, has uh, pushed aside the phone number of Pizza Hut 
and dominoes, but he's still, he's still consuming food. Why? Scholars tell us that when Daniel wrote this at this time, he is anywhere between the age of 85 and 90 years old. So this is what I would like to say. If you're past 80, uh, the Daniel um, dialed down version of a fast, that's for you, okay? But if you're 30 or 40 or 25 or 60, um, you probably are going to be okay with a normal type of fast. But this is something that Daniel is doing right around, probably, they actually think he's probably closer to 90. Remember, he went into captivity as one of the children of Israel, taken away, most likely around the age of 14 or 15, he was taken into captivity. But now he is a very old man. So he still needs some things to keep him going so that he can function. But Daniel knew, and all of the ancient Hebrew people knew, that in Hebrew, the word fast meant closed mouth. It literally means no food coming in. So the call this a fast is technically incorrect. This is not a fast. He's just dialing it back so that he can be more sensitive. But again, he's 90 years old, so he needs a little help. Praise the Lord. So I think we have to be careful of perhaps what we could call fads that swing to the body of Christ and people are doing a so-called Daniel fast and gaining weight. And, um, I, I just know you're not going to get the results that you want in that miracle realm. Um, if you're cruising really easy like that, praise God. Okay. We're not out as gluttons of punishment. We're not ascetics. That's not what we're talking about, but we are talking about true biblical fasting and for that, we don't have to apologize for. Praise God. Again, fasting in, uh, in the literal Hebrew means close your mouth. It means your mouth is closed and there's no food going in. Now, I did hear one very liberal theologian one time, you know, the kind that don't actually believe the Bible, the kind that denounced that the birth of Jesus was not actually through a virgin, the kind that questioned everything. I did hear one uh, very liberal theologian say that, the Hebrew phrase closing the mouth could possibly mean that you don't talk for a while. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, no, I'm not buying that. And there's no, there's no rabbi that's going to buy that because they all know what it means. By the way, in the Greek, it means the same thing when you're looking at it in the new Testament, it means no food is coming in. So fasting is when you are not eating. Now today, again, we do have areas where this phrase is misspoken and people say, well, Pastor Stephen, I'm fasting from social media, or they'll say things like I'm fasting from sports right now. I'm doing a 10 day sports fast, or they'll say I'm fasting from news, or they'll say I'm fasting from video games because I'm not going to play video games for 21 days. But that's also not fasting. That's simply abstinence. You are abstaining from something, perhaps so that you can spend more time in prayer, more time uh, in the Word of God, but that's not fasting. Fasting means closed mouth, no food coming in. Praise God. So we just want to be um, correct with the terminology that we use. So what I like to promote, I know many other very good ministers like to promote also because it's very effective and proven and it's biblical primarily is what I would call liquid fasting. And we see uh, here in Luke chapter, let's go over to Luke chapter four and take a look at this just for a moment. I've always greatly uh, loved this scripture. So we're going to Luke chapter four and Let's look at verse one. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, when they had ended, he was hungry. Now please notice that it does not say he was thirsty. He was hungry and he has used up all of his fat reserves. When that happens, you have a very brief little window before starvation hits or sets in. 
And then your body, if you go past that, that's a danger zone because your body will begin to cannibalize itself. So you know you're at the end of a fast when genuine hunger begins to kick in. So he was led by the Spirit, and he fasted for 40 days, and now he's hungry, but notice he was not thirsty. Jesus was drinking water because there would be these little streams out there in the wilderness, and he could safely drink uh, all the water that he needed. So... Liquid fast can be carried out for uh, various periods of time. A one-day, 24-hour fast can, uh, just by drinking liquid, whether it's water or juice is really good. For me, my favorite thing is now apple juice. That works very agreeably with my, with my stomach, and I'm comfortable with that. But just a 24-hour fast of not eating any food gives your body a break from all of the work that it constantly has to do with digestion and, uh, 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 and uh, the flushing and the cleansing. It gives all of your body parts a break, but it helps you to pray and stay in that area of the presence of the Lord. And it helps you just to maintain that even if it's only one day, perhaps one day out of the week, which would always be good. Or you just mix that in pretty often that one day can really start to get you back on track. Now, I've fasted two days, but I've never noticed any difference between one day and three day. For me, if I fast one day, I sense the presence of the Lord. If I fast uh, two days, nothing really different happens. But if I go three days and complete 72 hours of fasting with juice, with liquids, and no food... Then there's, there's another level of breakthrough that you will hit after three days. I've noticed that if I just do water after three days, if you drink a, uh, some form of like what I would call like Creek water that's been filtered. So there's no, you know, yucky stuff in it. You'll actually notice that water is sweet. Um, there's a town in Texas called Sweetwater, Texas, and it's because the water there that comes up through natural springs tastes sweet. And some of that has to do with a certain minerals in it. But if you go three days water fast, at the end of three days, you can usually taste the natural sweetness of water. Praise the Lord. But you'll also, most importantly, and this is what it's all about, you sense after three days another level of spiritual breakthrough. The presence of the Lord is stronger. The, uh, the knowing of the strength of true Christian faith is more vital in your heart. You're more sensitive to the Holy Spirit after fasting three days with no food. Praise God. The next level of breakthrough would come at the five day period. The first fast that I ever did with no food was for five days. And of course it was new to me. So I was kind of, uh, I wouldn't say terrified of fasting, but I was initially like, wow, can I actually do this? But God's grace was there. I actually fasted while I worked full time as a ditch digger and me and my, uh, I was working with an irrigation company. And while I would lay some of the pipes, Mainly, me and my friend Rick, we were the guys that would dig out the trenches. They would get dug out by a, you know, a big machine, but then there's a lot of small level dirt. you got to get all that out. And wow, it would get uh, to over 100 every single day, and I would just drink juice all day long. Now, at that point, I was drinking orange juice. Uh, today, I don't use orange juice. It's, uh, it's uh, like too acidic for me to be putting that much in. But then it didn't bother me or anything like that. So you find what makes you happy. So then I was drinking orange juice and working all day long, digging ditches. But I did that for five days, and then I came off that fast. And, uh, and you know, at night, I would go home because I was single. I would just go home and pray for a couple of hours, get up in the morning, pray for a couple of hours, and just drink orange juice nonstop. Did that for five days. After five days, I ate a salad and then got on a bus, and uh, me and a bunch of other Christians rode on the bus, and off we went to a Benny Hinn crusade. And I sat there, you know, uh, many, many seats back from the front, a little bit up in the balcony area. 
And as I was watching Pastor Benny Hinn minister for the first time in my life, I went into an open vision. And I began to see in the spirit realm. Now, I could see everything with my physical eyes, but I'm also seeing things happen in the spirit realm. And I could see that when Pastor Benny Hinn would walk like over to a certain area of the stage, he would say, the glory is here. And I could see it hanging over the people. And he would say, take it. And two things would happen. Glory would come out from him and the glory that was above the people would fall on them. And it looked like liquid white anointing. And soon, and, and this is what was amazing in the, uh, he would ask a whole group of people to stand up. And soon as that glory wave hit them, they would all fall back, but nobody would move or fall until instantly it hit them. And I could see it. And then he would walk over to the other side of the platform and say, over here, the glory is over here, stand up. And he would release the anointing and it would start flowing. It looked like literally like waves of the sea and it would get closer and closer to the people. And it would only take it like maybe two seconds to get there. But the moment the glory, which is invisible to the physical eye, but I could see it, the moment it would hit the people, they would all fall back. Praise God. So I, I was having a, a wonderful time. And then of course, eventually he said, if you feel called to the ministry, come up. And you know, we all began again, they ran up by the hundreds and uh, up at the front. And then it was, you know, another touch of the glory this time, a lot closer. And these things begin to happen. And over the years, you begin to get into the glory, into the anointing, into the spirit. But it was fasting that Along with, and I was already a person that prayed, and I was already a giver, but it was fasting that plugged into the good things I was already, already doing that opened up the spirit realm to me, where I began to see in the spirit realm, and uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit began to become active in my life, and that began to take place out of a lifestyle of fasting, coupled with prayer, and of course with giving. Now, there's another level that will break forth after five days. That's when you do a week. If you get the seven days and complete that with no food and you're drinking your juice, you're drinking your water, then you will reach another level of breakthrough. The next level takes place at 14 days being completed. And the next level after that takes place at 21 days of fasting and something very amazing takes place at 21 days and it's very consistent that if you will pray and seek the Lord and also if you let's say you're going 21 days you want to pull together what I call the trifecta okay because Jesus talked about the big three they are the disciplines not only disciplines they are what he is giving us and he uh, expects us to practice which are prayer giving and fasting so what you can do if let's say you go on a 21 day fast, liquid fast, and you're, you're going to drink a lot of liquid, you're going to drink a lot of juice, a lot of water. Okay. But what you want to do is you want to pray a whole lot as much as you can. Okay. And of course you're fasting. And then in order to pull the trifecta, the three things together at the end, after the conclusion, you want to give an offering, a special offering. And if you do all three together, then what happens is there's a breakthrough that takes place. It, it often, it even happens, it starts to happen before the fast is even completed. There is a breakthrough in finances. And many people, after they complete a 21 day fast, uh, many people experience uh, what I've noticed is um, crazy job breakthroughs, whether uh, let's say you're a salesman or sales lady, where you start getting like, huge contracts or crazy commissions, or um, l let's say you needed work and you secured a dream job and, uh, or that year you just make more money than you may maybe five times over anything you've ever made before. That's what I often see consistently of those that complete a 21 day fast. Praise God. Right now I am on, let's see here. I'm on day 23 of the fast that I'm on right now. And so I, I felt in my heart, you know, starting off, okay, I'll go, I'll go by God's grace, 21 days. Uh, so right now I feel I have fulfilled my commitment to the Lord, but I'm just kind of hanging out. Amen. Why? Because 
when we when we fast together, um, something dramatic also can happen. And I want to talk about that in just a moment. But that's why I share this, because I want people to jump on this blessing. I can't walk in these truths knowing how powerful they are and not teach them. And still, we'll, we're still very early in the year. But remember, in the spring, we go off to war. Okay, so you want to be geared up and ready for the full potential of what God has for you this year. So that's why I want to encourage you also to do some fasting. Amen. Now, the next level would be at 30 days. There's a breakthrough that will happen if you make it to 30 days. My wife and I uh, were invited to minister in Virginia. Uh, a wonderful man of God up there. He wanted me to preach. And I came up, when I came up to minister, he was actually on day 27 of a water fast. And the Lord gave Pastor Kelly a word for this pastor, and the word was, uh, the Lord wants you to wrap it up. And so on day 30, he did. He closed it out. And I tell you, he had energy, which is very unusual. If you can do water and you've got energy, he had energy. He had energy that would make the Energizer Bunny on those battery commercials. It would make the Energizer Bunny jealous. This guy had phenomenal energy, and he's just uh, moving around and praying, but doing things all day. And uh, but he needed desperately a money miracle. And after the end of thirty days, God answered him because he told this. This pastor told me gave him a six-figure miracle. And it, I guess the best way would say it was God bailed him out of financial hot water that he was in, and got him out. Got him out. Woo! Right after it happened, right after he completed his 30 day fast. So that is also a breakthrough level. Praise God. Glory. By the way, to flush all of the toxins out of your body, if you do water, it takes 10 days. That's running a whole lot of water through your body. Okay. If you do juice, it takes right around 30 days. Sometimes you can do it a little bit sooner, particularly if you're drinking a lot of uh, liquids. And I would en encourage you to do that. That's one of the main reasons people pull out of their fasting is because of fatigue. And what they're not realizing is they're not drinking enough liquids. You have really got to drink the liquids or else um, you can become very lethargic and tired. So you have to keep going because I know most of you, you're working full time. Now, if you can go off to an island all by yourself, then you can maybe do a water fast and just be laid out and lay out on the bed. Okay. But if you're working like so many of us are, you need your energy. So you're going to have to drink a lot of juice, a lot of liquid. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The next level would be, uh, 40 days. And we see our dear Lord Jesus completed his 40 day fast. And when you, when you're going 40 days, there really is a zone. There's like a zone you get into. And it's like, you have your, you have your tired moments. You have your moments of fatigue. Sure. That's just normal. But there's like a zone where like everything is like a laser and your thinking is just like, it's just like you, because your body is not having to do all this work digesting your brain. It just can think so sharp. And what will also happen if you're going out to the longer fast is that God will start talking to you. But here's the thing. For example, you may think that let's say for like a 40 day fast, you may think that the hardest day is maybe day 38 or day like number 40 or something like that. It's not the 40th day. It's not the hardest day. You know what the hardest day is? It's day number one. Day number one, no matter what your fast is going to be, is always the most difficult day. What's the second hardest day? It's day number two. What is the third hardest day of a fast? It's day number three. But what will happen is that if you just keep consuming the liquids, then you will break past what I call the initial waves. Let's say you're standing on the beach and you want to get out to the deeper water. Uh, you have, let's say you have a surfboard, 
But what you have to do is you have to get past that first set of breakers. You have to get back behind those waves. And if you want to keep going, you can get out where it's peaceful and just kind of float around and be happy. But if you don't get out past those, those things will just buffer you and hit you and roll you all over the place. So you have to get past those sets of breakers and get past out there. That's, that's what's going on within the first five days is you're kind of getting buffeted. Now you may get past it in three days. For me, it's like there is a lot of unpleasantness uh, the first five days. There's the uh, uh, kind of like edginess, agitation, but not being able to eat your favorite foods. For me, it's not even food. It's more like snacks. There are certain snacks I really like, uh, almost more than a meal. I like my little snacks. But uh, you, you have that deprivation, and that's impacting your soul, your, your, you know, your emotions and your feelings. Um, but here's the thing. If you'll just stick with it and keep drinking your liquids, after about three to five days, you'll get out there, and now things are calm. And your body will begin to settle down, and it's, uh, uh, the hunger will begin to subside. And that doesn't mean that you might not think about a cheeseburger. It doesn't mean that you don't think, hey, I, could, I would certainly enjoy a nice meal. But it, it's like it doesn't really bug you. You're just walking it out now. You're having your time with the Lord, and you're walking it out and enjoying the Lord's presence. Amen. And sometimes you'll get hit with these zinger-like headaches. Wham! They'll hit your head. What a lot of believers don't understand is that when that happens, see, some, sometimes when some Christians say, oh, I'm getting these awful headaches, and they'll stop the fast, they don't realize that is a symptom of the poisons and the toxins that are in your body from all the junky foods with all of the preservatives and all of the chemicals that are in them. That is the flushing mechanism happened that is taking place. And sometimes you'll get those little headache spikes. And so that means the toxins are getting flushed out. Praise the Lord. Now, of course, uh, there's a couple of things you need to be aware of. Number one, let's say that you are a woman and you're a pregnant woman. Uh, I would advise that you not fast. Okay, so don't don't fast. And number two, if you are on any kind of, you know, like prescription medication, you really need to check with your doctor. And um, especially, especially on anything beyond three days. Because I have a pastor friend of mine, and he did a 10-day water fast. I think he was actually going to go longer, but on the 10th day of a water fast, while he was in the kitchen getting something, he passed out. While he was passing out, as he was collapsing, his chin bumped the granite countertop as he was falling and uh, knocked a bunch of tooth le uh, uh, teeth loose in his mouth, and he died. They, somebody found him very quickly, but they took him to the hospital, and they did the shock treatment, and brought him back three times each time he died. But on the third time, thank God, they were able to revive him. They were, they were jolted him, too, because he was a goner. He came back, and the doctor said, what did you do? The doc, uh, and the pastor said, well, I was doing a water fast. The doctor said, whoa, no wonder. No wonder. He said, you never should have done that on these heavy prescription drugs that you're on. So things like that, be careful. And use, use common sense, okay? I think... The Holy Spirit helps us, and we know these things, but uh, just submit those things to the Lord. But for the average person, you know, with good health and everything's okay, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get a really good reflect, uh, uh, refreshing, and it's amazing how many people also get healed from diabetes while they're uh, on a, a good liquid fast. Praise God. You know, on a personal note, years back, my father told me something very interesting, and he's in heaven now. My dad Love the Lord. Um, uh, I've got his Bible. He he was a real student of the Word of God, and uh, was a very godly man. But you know what? My dad always struggled with uh, the willingness to exercise. He was always a little overweight, and he, because of that, had quite a few health problems. And because of that, he was receiving many prescription pills. Uh, matter of fact, he told me there were fifteen drugs that he had to take. And if one of them was missed, he could die at any moment. So that's the need that he had. But this is also something that he told me that the doctor told him that if you can just lose 15 pounds, not 50, not 70, if you can just 
lose 15 pounds, I can take you off every single one of these prescription drugs and you won't need them anymore. But you know what? He, uh, for whatever reason, was never able to do that. But my friends, I'm telling you that uh, uh, liquid fasting, uh, while we do it for spiritual purposes, and that's really for me all my focus, uh, it does do things that are very, very wonderful for your body. Can you say, praise the Lord, and yes, you will lose weight. Now, of course, I'm losing weight, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gain weight back when I eat. But at least you have the opportunity to, in many ways, recalibrate your system so that previously, if your eating habits were very unhealthy, or now you've cleansed everything. I mean, it's like uh, doing a complete engine uh, rebuild, and uh, you want to run good oil and fuel through the new system. Praise God. You know what I'm saying. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, Jesus was led by the Spirit of God on a 40-day fast. You know, the Holy Spirit knew what was coming. Pastor Stephen, what was coming? The devil. And the Holy Spirit knew that. This major, epic showdown, like the old Westerns, the shootout at the, uh, at the corral at noon. Well, the ultimate shootout was about to take place. And Satan, who took down the first Adam, is going to come, and he's now going to try to take out the second Adam. And uh, wow. So the Holy Spirit was like, I'm going to get Jesus, and I'm going to lead him into the wilderness, and I'm going to get him ready so that when this guy shows up, he, Jesus is ready for anything. And how many of you know he was? Woo, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And the miracle ministry of Jesus and all of the wonderful things that happened. You know what? If he could have gotten it on prayer and giving alone, then why in the world would he fast? If he could overcome these things and have what it took to get it done just on prayer alone and just on being a good giver, then why would he fast? But no, my friends, he did a long fast, praise God, because he knew it was necessary. The Holy Spirit knew this was something that he's got to go through. So there are three disciplines. We could call them three duties. And they are when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. In Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 18, we see that each one is associated with a reward that God releases to the person that does it with the right spirit, with the right heart, but who practices these three duties. Matthew 6, verse 18. But, verse 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. Now watch this. And your father who sees in secret will reward, will reward you openly. Praise God. So there is a reward associated with giving. There is a reward associated with prayer. And there is a reward that is associated with fasting. Praise God. And there are rewards that come by fasting that, that will not come through prayer and giving alone. The fasting is what can take you into a completely different dimension of the blessing reward of God. Mm -mm. So if you don't practice it, you cannot come into that because that's the key of how you get into that dimension. Praise you, Lord. Without the third discipline of fasting, it's like all of your life you own a beautiful sports car, say like a Ferrari, okay? But you never shift it beyond second gear. <laughs> Although it's got other gears you can go into, you just drive it around second gear all the time. And you never get it out on the freeway of your destiny and put that thing in the third gear. Mm -mm. Wow. That is what's going to take place with you. And you're going to realize, wow, there is another whole gear. There is another whole dimension of reward and blessing in the Lord that's connected through fasting. Matthew chapter 17. Let me go back there just for a moment. I want to drop by verse 19 this time. Matthew 17, we're going down to verse 19. Verse 19. 
Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it, that would be the demon, out? Verse 20. So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing, listen to that. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Mm -mm. If you want to receive the great things that God has for you, fasting must become one of your disciplines that you practice regularly. Praise God. Now, as you pray, and as you give, and as you fast, a financial blessing is going to come your way. Praise the Lord. Look at this one more time. I love this when Jesus says, however, this kind does not go out. However, and what, watch this. What he's saying is that in other words, this kind of faith that I'm walking in, that I know you want to come into this kind of faith that speaks to the mountain and the mountain actually has to do what you say, whether that mountain is a demon, whether the mountain is epilepsy, whatever that mountain might be. Okay. If you want to come into that and you want to, in other words, he says, however, this kind, in other words, the kind of faith that does that, you can't get into it without prayer and fasting. Mm -mm. So mountain moving faith takes more than just speaking to the mountain. Although we need to do that. That is biblical, but you must speak and blast it from a platform of mustard seed faith. That is a mustard seed of the God kind of faith. And that is enough to get the job done and it will get it done. He said it would, but that, that blasting power comes from yeah, sure. A giving heart, a person that's a giver, a person that prays. Absolutely. But you're going to have to get fasting in there on these stubborn mountains. That's what it takes. Jesus said that right here. Woo. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. A financial blessing comes your way as you begin to seek the Lord in fasting and prayer, particularly on a 21 day fast. Stop and think about it in just a moment, or excuse me, just for a moment, as we reflect back on the book of Genesis, on the life of Adam, and his mutiny against God, his high treason against his own creator, and he listens to the devil, he and Eve partake of the fruit, and now the curse of sin has now been released into the earth. So when that took place and the curse is now reverberating throughout the entire planet and now endeavoring to impact every human who will ever walk on the earth, what was the first effect of the curse? Number one, spiritual death. Adam lived for 930 years. So it did take sin a while to eventually kill his physical body. By the way, death is an enemy. There will come a day when death is thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, hallelujah. What a wonderful day that will be. But even though he lived to be 930, the moment he and Eve ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. So they are now spiritually dead. The curse is now working. So we have spiritual death that affects them immediately. And what other awful effect followed right on the trail of it. The curse now of poverty, financial lack, financial worry and fear. And now they have to work and sweat while they work and they have a problem. What are these things growing now in the garden? Thorns and thistles. Well, actually they've been kicked out of the garden, but what are these things that are now growing in these areas that are trying to plant thorns and thistles and weeds and briars. And while they're trying to grow food, now they have to protect themselves from uh, animals because this whole thing is now changed because of sin. 
And oh, it just was an absolute mess. So now has entered into the earth, the thing of great financial difficulty or even poverty, but fasting begins to release the provision that God has for you. I already know that you're a giver that positions you for it. And I know that you pray, but fasting begins to cause the dynamic of miracles to work in your life so that you begin to experience God's blessing and financial relief for your life. Luke chapter four, again, let me jump back over there. Luke chapter four, verse 17. And he that would be Jesus was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place, watch this. He found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to who? The poor, the poor. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is basically saying, I have the anointing and the anointing is an empowerment. I have the anointing to break poverty off of your life. That's exactly what he's saying. I have the anointing. The spirit of God is on me to break poverty off of your life. You don't have to live in it anymore. And that's what an anointing does because lack its efficiency or what we would call penury, which, which is hard poverty. It all has a spiritual root that comes out of the effects of the curse, which is why certain cities, certain undeveloped nations have had government programs or other nations pouring billions, sometimes billions and billions of dollars of aid into those countries. And they're no better today than what they were before all of the money was poured into them. The only thing that has happened is that corruption and coups and civil wars have multiplied more. Why? Poverty has a spiritual root. But what did Jesus say? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He is telling the poor, I've got the power to get you out of poverty. The anointing's on me to break it off of your life. Mm, 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 mm. Prayer, giving, and fasting breaks poverty and financial lack off of your life. And I'll tell you something else. God can, when you put them all three together, God can move quick and God can do some miracles. He sure can. And he sure does. Praise God. Now, most fast in the Bible, if you actually examine them, most of the fasts that are mentioned in the Bible were corporate type fast. In other words, it wasn't an individual fast, although there's plenty of examples of that. But so often we see it's when God's people would come together and fast together. And when that happens, uh, it creates a very uh, powerful dynamic. As we begin to experience the power of God, what happens is that breakthroughs start to take place. And as we share these breakthroughs, others hear about it. And it so often it starts to ricochet and it starts to like uh, get kinetic where it starts taking place. And suddenly 14 people have had their children uh, come off drugs or 20 people have now uh, purchased a home for the first time in their life and breakthroughs start to happen all over the place. Marriages are restored. Uh, healings begin to spring forth. Just like Isaiah chapter 58 says it will happen. Mm. Mountains of problems that would seem impossible. They, those mountains just dissolve. Well, they just dissolve and you see what to do every single time. And you're not afraid of it anymore. Praise God. Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. My friends, I want you to pray about doing a fast. Perhaps the Holy Spirit would lead you to do a 21 day liquid juice fast. I'm still going for a while, but just jump in. Praise God. I'm not the only one. There's others also that have emailed me and said, Pastor Steve, and I'm in and they're sailing right along too. But remember in the spring, we go off to war. Doesn't mean you can't fast later, but I will say this. There is never ever, ever a convenient time to fast. 
There's always something going on. There's always a birthday. There's always a celebration. There's always uh, the big buffet, uh, you know, the big free buffet at lunch or something like that at work, you know, that they uh, happen to bring out right, right when you start your fast. But remember, there is rewards that go to the person that will fast and seek the Lord. And this is your year of miracles and breakthroughs. I want to encourage you to walk in the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will see miracles happen in your life. As a matter of fact, I would like for you to take a sheet of blank paper, and I would like for you to write out the miracles that you want God to do. Maybe you want God to uh, uh, help get an awful debt, maybe a very toxic debt paid off and out of your life. Maybe you want to see your family members saved and come to the Lord. Maybe you have a son or daughter uh, addicted to something. Maybe, the, maybe they're addicted to uh, tobacco products, or maybe you are. God can break those things, praise God. But I'll tell you, you'll also see God's financial strength sweep in and bring the refreshing that you need. I know some of you business owners, you're feeling the heat, um, and you're thinking, God, please help me. And God will help you. But remember that explosive mustard seed faith that can speak and the demons got to go. The mountains got to go. Jesus said, you can't move it without prayer and fasting. Okay. So we must embrace the full gospel. We can't say we're westernized. We don't practice that in our culture. My friends, anything that you omit from the word of God, you omit it um, to your own detriment. But if we will walk in these things, we will experience the blessings that are associated with them. This is going to be an epic year for you. Please lift your hands. Heavenly Father, I pray for your people that are watching right now. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts about what they are supposed to do. And I thank you that you have the power, you have the ability to change their situation, and you're going to work for them. Now, speak to their hearts in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. To me, one of the greatest encouraging fasting testimonies I've ever heard was the one by Dr. Jerry Falwell when he was facing a double crisis. Liberty University was millions and millions of dollars in debt, and Liberty University was facing losing their accreditation because of their unstable financial situation. Jerry Falwell, uh, Pastor Falwell, said it was time to pull out all the stops and he shut down everything in his ministry that God never told him to do in the first place, which was really good. And he launched into a 40 day liquid fast with no food. Remember, he's a good Southern Baptist, praise God. But this is what I want to say. It doesn't matter if you're Southern Baptist, charismatic Catholic, Episcopal or whatever. As long as your heart belongs to Jesus and you're a believer and you're calling out the God, God's no respecter. God's no respecter of the Christian, regardless of what stream or tribe you might be in. Just like Israel, 12 tribes were one nation, we're one body. He'll minister to you wherever you're at. Praise God. Hallelujah. But Dr. Falwell sought the Lord for 40 days fasting, and he kept, and he had to tell his church members, just like I have to tell you, because I'm in, I'm in the public eye. You, Dr. Falwell can't be standing before the people, losing all this weight, and people thinking, is something wrong with him? Is he sick? So he had to tell the congregation what he was doing. And, you know, they're, they're praying for him. And I want to say thank you for praying for me. I want to also encourage you to pray for me and my wife. Amen. And this ministry. And Dr. Falwell said that during the first 40 days, he asked the Lord for, for money. And the Lord spoke to his heart and said, I don't want to talk with you about money. I want your heart to get back into a right place with me. I want you to get close to me again. And so for the whole 40 day fast, it was just get close to the Lord, get all of that ironed out, get close to God. So he came off the 40 day fast and he felt a great peace and he ate for 21 days and he gained back all of the weight that he had lost. He had lost 40 pounds and he gained it all back in three weeks, eating, having a good time. By the way, food tastes so good after a fast. Woo! It tastes, it's like your taste buds got cleansed and everything, your the food smells better, tastes better, everything.
Well, this is what was amazing. After 21 days of gaining the weight back, the Holy Spirit spoke to Dr. Falwell and said, I'm ready to talk with you now about money. Woo! He went right back into another 40 day liquid fast with not even a peanut, no food. And he lost all the weight again. And he finished that 40 day fast, came off of it. And then he sensed in his heart, God's going to do something. Woo. God's going to do something. I know the ministry drowning in debt and I know these problems are still here. God's going to do something. God's going to do it. And a man just a few days later walked onto the campus and handed Dr. Falwell a check for 50 million U.S. dollars. Amen. And they blasted that debt, began to pay that debt down. That man came back and later gave another check for $20 million. Did you know that today, Liberty University has an endowment that's over $1 billion. That makes a lot of these Division I schools envious. Woo! It's amazing. And another miracle happened. God sent them a man the former president, if I'm correct, of Georgia Tech University, sent him to lead the university forward through all of the accreditation testing and through all of these technical areas that really they needed a specialist. And that man came in and put the university on solid ground so that when the accreditation testers came and saw the health and the vitality and the financial strength of the university and all the criteria was met. They passed them with flying colors. So you're, you're completely good to go now. And so they survived and today they're thriving. So this is what I want to say as I close, Dr. Falwell refused to let his baby die. That's the greatest thing that he was known for the church. He pastored and the university that God called him and Mr. Elmer towns to raise up. That was the baby. So you can let your baby die or you can jump in there and say, I'm pulling out all the strings. I may be an American. Our, our American church may not do this, but you better grab hold of fasting. Mm -mm. And that's what he did. And today, because he did that, look at him now, the largest online university, uh, not only in America, in, in the world, praise God. Amen. God's going to do miracles for you. God will do miracles for Baptists. God will do miracles for Pentecostals. God will do miracles for Catholics. If you give, pray, and fast, get ready. You're going to meet the miracle working God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Write down what you want God to do on paper. Take that paper, fold it up, and keep it with you. Maybe you want to put it in your shoe. Maybe you want to put it in your pocket. Maybe you want to put it somewhere where you can get quick access to it and pull it out, pray over that prayer list, and, uh, and just go for it. Don't overanalyze fasting. Just do it. It's not that complicated. Pray and drink a whole bunch of liquid and just keep going. And just, grind, just some days can be a little bit of a grind, but just go through it. Before you know it, you'll be at the finish line. If you're watching today and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to receive salvation through Jesus. If you used to be a Christian, but you've fallen away from God, uh, it's time for you to get your life right with God. I want you to pray this prayer also. Okay. Please pray this Lord Jesus. I surrender my life to you. I repent of all of my sins. Come into my heart. Wash me with your precious blood. Write my name in your book of life. And Jesus Step into my life and lead me and guide me forward from this day forward. In your beautiful name I pray. Amen and amen. Woo! Welcome to the family of God. Mm, 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 mm. Praise the Lord. Let's take Holy Communion today. I want you to grab some unleavened bread and some grape juice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and this juice. We bless it now and set it apart as being holy through this prayer. And we thank you that this is now the body and the blood of Jesus. Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we thank you for the grace, the strength, and the wisdom to fast. And we thank you, Father God, for the miracles that you are working 
out and bringing forth all for your glory. And we give you praise. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the Lord's body. You know, for many of you, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really going to pop out. For some of you, for the first time, they'll just flow out so easily because you've already been praying with good teaching, and uh, you already have a good prayer life. So when you begin to put this fasting in there, you're going to see the gifts of the Spirit just pop out. Some of you will have visions for the first time. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus we thank you for its mighty cleansing power. Father, if anyone has sinned against us, we forgive them and bless them in Jesus' name. And we go on with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit speaking to us, even in beautiful prophetic ways, dreams, visions, fun things that you have for us. Father, we bless your name. We give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the blood of the Lord Jesus. Woo, praise the Lord. Mm -mm. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit is moving. Isaiah chapter 58 is also a tremendous chapter. We didn't really have time to get into any of that today. Probably one of the best uh, chapters to have with you to meditate on as you are progressing through your fast. Praise God. Well, the presence of the Lord is here. The Holy Spirit is here. Father, we just thank you. The Holy Spirit is speaking right now, showing you the route, the, the journey, the plan that he has for you. So just follow that leading of the Holy Spirit, and he'll have you ready, just like he got Jesus ready. He'll have you ready for anything and everything. And you'll walk in that anointing more than a conqueror. Praise God. Father, bless your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'll look forward to seeing you back next time. Don't forget the Israel tour. Those of you that want to come, get signed up. Get registered. The entire brochure is at our website, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Have a great week. Bye-bye.